Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. We're going to talk about a man today who seems to be the exact opposite of a model. He's blind. He is a beggar. He is both metaphorically as well as geographically at the bottom. He's metaphorically at the bottom because he's a beggar. He's kind of at the, the lower rung of society. And he's geographically at the bottom because he's actually about eight or 900 feet below sea level. sea level. He's in the city of Jericho, way down low. But this particular guy, Bartimaeus, who's a blind beggar living in Jericho, he happens to be the model disciple. Now, up to this point in Mark chapter 10, Jesus has encountered several different people who could be disciples and some of whom are disciples, but they're all, to one degree or another, lacking really in the kind of qualities that a disciple should have. So they're full of themselves, as the disciples happen to be, or they're struggling for power, as the disciples happen to be, or they're like the rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus earlier in Mark. And because he has great riches and Jesus tells him to sell these riches and to give it to the poor, he walks away from Jesus. But then we come to Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, really nothing to offer Jesus, metaphorically, geographically, at the lowest point. And it is he who makes this great confession of Jesus as the son of David, who cries out for the very thing that is the exemplary cry of the disciples of Jesus for mercy. And so it is Bartimaeus who becomes not only the only named person in Mark's gospel who is healed, but also becomes kind of the, the name, the model, the example for us to follow as we too follow Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. So, Let's, first of all, kind of get our, our, our feet wet in this text by looking at the first verse or two, and then looking at a map to see exactly where this event takes place. So Mark chapter 10, verse 46 says this, And they came to Jericho. And as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Now, where are we? Well, as you can see on the map here, this is going to give it, kind of give you both the, uh, the big view as well as the, the narrow view of exactly where Jesus is located and where he has been. So you can see the Sea of Galilee, of course, at the very bottom, you've got the Dead Sea. Jesus has been working his way southward from the north side of the Sea of Galilee at Capernaum down to the other side, the Transjordan side of the river, and he's coming to the city of Jericho. And then on the, the, the small part of the map, you can see that he's going to Jericho, and then he will go up from Jericho to Jerusalem. Of course, you always go up when you go to Jerusalem. And you can kind of see here on this next map exactly why you go up to Jerusalem, because Jericho is eight or 900 feet below sea level. It's, of course, very close to, to the Dead Sea, but Jerusalem itself is about 2,500 feet above sea level. So you have this road that's about, it's a long day's journey, but about a one day journey from Jericho up into Jerusalem. So that's where we find ourselves. Now, what's been happening up to this point is something that you're probably familiar with if you've been watching these other videos. You've had Jesus interacting with the rich young ruler. You've had Jesus interacting with his disciples. You have Jesus teaching about everything from marriage to becoming like little children to what to do with riches, so on and so forth. Now, as we get ready for chapter 11 of Mark, we're getting ready for all the events that are going to transpire during Holy Week, beginning with Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. So let's work our way through a few details in this particular text to kind of get our bearings so that we know where we've been and where we're going, and some of the details are going to help us along the way. First of all, who's this they? They came to Jericho. Well, it's the same group that's also designated in other parts of this verse, the disciples and this great crowd. So when you kind of picture this scene of Jesus surrounded by these people, don't picture just Jesus and his 12 disciples, but picture a pretty large crowd. It's a large pilgrim throng of all these followers of Jesus, and they're on their way to Jerusalem 
to celebrate the Passover. So they're working their way southward, and now they're about to work their way up to Jerusalem. It's a big, big crowd of people with Jesus when all of these events with Bartimaeus transpire. Secondly, who is Bartimaeus? Well, as I mentioned, he is the only person in the Gospel of Mark who receives a healing from Jesus and is designated by name, which, of course, that alone sets him apart. So it's kind of funny in, when, you, when you think about exactly what the name means, because Mark, as it were, sort of repeats himself. Because so Bartimaeus, the name itself, is really two different names, we might say. Bar is the Aramaic for son or son of. So Bar Timaeus is the son, the Bar of Timaeus. So Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And then Mark turns right around and specifies, just in case we miss that, that he's the blind beggar, the son of Timaeus. So Bartimaeus and son of Timaeus means exactly the same thing. Then he's designated also as not only blind, but he's a beggar. Now, we might compare what's happening here with, with, with Bartimaeus to what happened in an earlier part of Mark, in chapter 8, verses 20 through, 22 through 26. So this is these two particular episodes, the healing of the blind man in chapter 8, and that remember, that was sort of a twofold healing. And this healing in chapter 10, those two healings of the two blind men are the bookends of what is sometimes referred to as Act 2 of Mark's Gospel. Act 2 is where you have passion predictions, you have a lot of teaching about Jesus, he's working his way to Jerusalem. Act 2 is about eight, chapter 8, verse 22, through chapter 10, verse 52, which is the end of this particular section. So we're at the end of Act 2 of Mark's Gospel. Act 3 is going to pick up when he gets into Jerusalem, and then, of course, all the other events transpire with Holy Week. He's also a beggar, not only blind, but he's a beggar, and we can compare that with the rich young ruler that we talked about a couple of videos before. We'll make a more detailed comparison with them in a couple of minutes. Then, where's he at? He's by the roadside. And of course, this is, if you're a blind beggar, that's the place you want to be because you know people are going to be passing by. They've avoided Samaria. They've gone through the Transjordan area, and now they're wake, working their way up to Jerusalem. So, of course, these pilgrims are going to be the ones you cry out to for alms, for donations as they work their way up for this religious festival. So that kind of tells us where we're at. We're in Jericho. We're way down low. Where we're going, we're going up to Jerusalem and who this guy is. He's not only blind, not only a beggar, but we know his name, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. So as this is going on, what happens? Well, we're told what happens in the next couple of verses, 47 and 48. When he heard it, that is when Bartimaeus heard it, when he heard specifically that it was Jesus of Nazareth, which evidently he had heard about before. Of course, there were all sorts of reports about Jesus going around. So Bartimaeus had already heard of who Jesus was, knew where he was from. And so what did he do? He began to cry out. And here's what he cried out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. This, of course, is not unusual for either the disciples of Jesus or for the crowds. They're always telling people they don't think are worthy of Jesus' attention, whether they're people like the blind beggar or like the children that the disciples try to keep away from Jesus. People are always trying to filter others away from Jesus. Oh, he doesn't have time for you. Oh, you're not important enough for him. But as we'll see, Jesus completely reverses that. But they rebuke him. They tell him to shut up, be silent. But he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, you might be saying to yourself, and I hope you are saying to yourself, why did he ex use this exact language when he cried out? Why not just, Jesus, have mercy on me? Why did he specifically say, Jesus, Son of David, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of David, have mercy on me. What's behind this particular designation, son of David? Well, to know the answer to that, we need to go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, one of these very pivotal chapters in the Old Testament concerning the promise of the Messiah and who he was going to be and how he was connected to the, to the family of David. 
So if you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, I encourage you to look at the whole chapter, or if you're interested, you can look in my podcast, 40 Minutes in the Old Testament, where Dan Price and I discuss this at length. But just for now, look at these verses 11 through 16. This is when David wanted to build a temple, a permanent structure for the Lord, and then Nathan the prophet comes to him with a message in which God says, thanks, but no thanks. I've got another idea. Here's what's going to happen. You're not going to build a house for me, but, picking up here with verse 11, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. So David, you're not going to build God a house. He's going to build you one. And this is not going to be a physical structure. This is a dynastic house, a dynasty for David. He says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you. So a physical descendant. He's going to come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. This is talking about the messianic son of David who is to come. So God's going to establish his throne. He's going to build his kingdom. He's going to build his house. He says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be a father to him. He'll be a son to me. It talks about the discipline that will come if he commits iniquity. And then it wraps up with saying, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, what this is talking about, especially if you look at the whole context of what is spoken here by Nathan to David, God is basically saying this. Listen, David, I'm going to raise up your descendant after you. He's going to have a permanent kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. He's going to reign on your throne forever. This is the promise of the Messiah. Now, what's happened, if you look at the big sweep of the biblical narrative, is that over time, God has become more and more specific as to who the Messiah is going to be the descendant of. So, for instance, if you look on this chart here, this diagram, you'll see that when God first gives the promise of this seed, it's very general. It could be any woman's offspring. So it's the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15. Then, a little bit later, it, Noah, it narrows to Noah and then his son, Shem. And then it narrows further to Abraham, passed on to Isaac, passed on to Jacob. So it's going to be part of Jacob's descendants. But Jacob then narrows it even further. It's going to be from his son's tribe, Judah, not from the other tribes. Now, when we get to David, we know that it's not only going to come from the tribe of Judah, but from the family of Judah. David. And so David's family becomes that last designated part of Israel from which the Messiah will come. Then what happens as you go into the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea, I've got their quotes there up on the screen. They know that the Messiah is going to be the son of David, but they have a sort of shorthand that they use. They don't even say the son of David, but they call David, they call the Messiah, they call the Christ David himself. So for instance, Jeremiah says, they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king. And Ezekiel, I will raise up one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. Or Hosea, afterward, the Israelites shall return, seek the Lord their God and David their king. So interestingly, when you go in the Old Testament, you find the prophets de designating the Messiah by the name of David. Now, when you get to the first century, if you were to stop any Israelite on the street and ask them, hey, it, who exactly will the Messiah be like? If you, like if you had to choose one character from the Old Testament as to, uh, to be the one that most closely resembles or pictures or foreshadows who the Messiah is going to be, if you were to ask any first century Israelite, that question, most likely the answer you would receive is David. David, of course. He is the model, the paradigm for who the Messiah will be. Therefore, when you get to the first century, there's a lot of expectation that this son of David, the Messiah, is going to be the one who comes and, of course, rules on the throne of David. That, then, is why he is confessed to be the son of David. David. And that means that when Bartimaeus cries out, son of David, not once, but twice, that's basically the equivalent of saying, Jesus the Christ. Because the son of David is just basically another title that means the Messiah, the Christ, 
be anointed one of God, the king who is to come. So Bartimaeus gives us this bold, clear, public confession that Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Messiah, is, in fact, the Christ. But he does that by calling him the son of David. What does he ask for? Well, Bartimaeus asked that the son of David give to him mercy. He says, eleazon me, have mercy on me, which is from the verb eleo, and we get our prayer, our common prayer, kirie eleazon from that. So, Lord, have mercy. That's the same verb that he uses here. He's asking the Messiah to give him this mercy, this undeserved love, this this action on his behalf, on his behalf to, to give to Bartimaeus that which he could never acquire on his own, could never deserve, but instead he's asking the Messiah to lavish upon him this divine and healing love. Well, does he get this? Uh, how does Jesus respond? Let's see in the verses that follow. This is 49 through 52. Jesus stopped, which I think is a beautiful expression. So Jesus stopped. He just stopped in the road. You can imagine the crowd, this great throng of people stopping. They're going to see what's going to happen. And he says, call him. And this crowd that before had told him to be silent and to leave him alone, now they act as those who summon him. So they call the blind man. They say, take heart, get up. He's calling you. So he throws off his cloak. And he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, Rabboni, in uh, in the Greek. We'll look at that in just a second. So Rabbi, Rabboni, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. The Greek there is literally has saved you. We'll look at that in just a second too. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. So let's look at some details. First of all, he apoballoed his cloak. He threw off his cloak. And I think that's a great contrast with what we saw earlier with the rich young ruler in this same chapter in verses 21 and 22. Remember, he came to Jesus. They had a little dialogue back and forth. And the guy said, I've kept all the commandments. Jesus said, well, you only lack one thing then. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But he was gloomy or disheartened or depressed by that saying, and he went a sorrowful because he had great possessions. Now, contrast that with what Bartimaeus does here. He apobalod, he threw off his cloak, and he sprang up, and he came to Jesus. He, as it were, got rid of the only thing that he had. He threw away his cloak, and he runs to Jesus. Now, What about some other details? I love this question. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. And I love it because I like to contrast that with what we saw earlier in chapter 10, right before this, in fact. James and John, those sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, they came to Jesus and they said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them in almost the exact same Greek, what do you want me to do for you? So contrast those two questions. The sons of Zebedee, what do they want from Jesus? Well, they want to sit on his right and on his left in his kingdom. They want power. They want glory. They want fame. They want all this stuff for themselves. That's what they want. It's not what they need, but it's what they want. Then Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And all he wants is mercy. He wants the mercy that is shown to him in the recovery of his sight. And if you're interested, you can go to 1517.org. You can look at an article that I wrote a couple years ago called The Most Frightening Question God Can Ask Us, in which I talk about what it means for God to ask each of us, what do you want me to do for you? Thirdly, he says, Rabbi, or in Greek, it's Rabuni. This is a Uh, kind of a longer version of rabbi. Rabbi and rabboni or rabuni all mean basically the same thing. Literally, it's my teacher, but uh, this is a little bit different form here. He's calling him his teacher, uh, just like other disciples and other individuals who weren't necessarily disciples referred to Jesus as a rabbi 
for a Rabboni. Then he says, Jesus says, go your way, your faith has saved you, which is translated here in the ESV as made you well. Now you might be wondering, well, why is it, why they translate made you well instead of saved you? The reason is because very often in the scriptures, beginning already in the Old Testament, especially the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that verb sozo, which is the one that means to save or deliver, refers not only to what we usually think of being saved in a spiritual sense, like has Jesus saved you, but sozo very often refers to a physical kind of deliverance. So you are literally like saved from a disaster. You're saved from death. You're saved from destruction. You're saved from illness in this particular case. So it doesn't always have this connotation of, of some sort of spiritual deliverance from everlasting death. To be saved, to be sozo, in the Old Testament and New Testament often just simply means to be rescued from some physical peril, but it often also has kind of a double, double nuance to it where it implies not only this physical deliverance, but also a spiritual deliverance, which is probably what is intended here. Your faith has made you well, but it's also brought you to me. It's also saved you in that sense. And then finally, the man's sight is given to him or recovers his sight, and he follows Jesus on the hodos, on the way. Now, the way we heard about already at the opening of Mark's gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then we have this quote from Isaiah, which is applied to the ministry of John the Baptist, where we read, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the Hodos, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, the reason this is significant is because this is sort of coming full circle here. Mark's gospel begins with reference to the way, this way of salvation that Isaiah talks about, such as in Isaiah chapter 35, this way of holiness, this road of holiness, this way in which God's people are going to come home to Zion through the ministry of the promised son of David. Now, what is happening in the rest of the gospel is that Jesus is working his way, his way along the way to Jerusalem, where his destination will be reached. So this blind man joins Jesus on the way, the way that John the Baptist had prepared, the way that is leading from Jericho up to Jerusalem where Jesus will reach his goal of being arrested, crucified, and resurrected on our behalf. So if you're reading through the rest of Mark's gospel, you know you're about to leave chapter 10, and you're going to step into chapter 11, which is Palm Sunday, and then all the events of Passion Week unfold. So the reason that Mark puts the story of blind Bartimaeus where he does is because this becomes the model for the followers of Jesus. In reality, we're all blind beggars. We, we all are in need of the mercy of the Son of David. And so we have nothing to offer God, but he has everything to offer to us. We have nothing except emptiness for him to fill. And so we pray for mercy, and we confess that he is, in fact, the Messiah. He is the Son of David. And he stops, and he shows mercy to us. And our faith our belief in the Messiah is that by which we are delivered, that by which we are saved. And what happens then? We follow Jesus. We follow him on the way that leads to everlasting life. How do we get to everlasting life? By being crucified and resurrected with him in the waters of baptism. That's how we reach eternal life. That is the way in which we follow him. So Bartimaeus is the model disciple, this blind beggar, this one who receives mercy, whose eyes are open so that he truly sees what even those with eyes very often don't see. He sees that Jesus is the fulfillment of 2 Samuel chapter 7. He is the son of David, and he is going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem, the throne which is the cross. And then we follow him, that co-crucified and co-resurrected with him, we too might receive his mercy and become his disciples. So that's a run through of Mark chapter 10. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thank you for watching. If it has been helpful, please share it with your friends. And I pray that God's mercy and his grace may be yours in abundance as you too believe in and follow Jesus, the son of David.
Thanks, and we'll see you next week.